So as you saw, my baby's name is Hugh. I like that name. It's uh, I try to find names that are unique but not unheard of, and evidently the popularity of Hugh is at an all-time low. So I thought, buy low, sell high, you know? <laughs> my daughter's name is uh, Daphne. I did the same thing with her. I was like, hey. A uh, true story about my daughter, sorry, too much too much baby talk, but that's where my mind is. Uh, I was married to a different person when I lived here last, and um, I didn't know she was pregnant. We didn't know, and I went out drinking at the Red Lion Tavern downtown, and I came back home, and I was like, hey, if we ever have a daughter's name, a daughter, we should name her Daphne. And so, yeah, that's a true story. Daphne's name from the Red Lion. Somehow it hit me, inspiration hit me in the middle of the Red Lion. And people tell me it's a terrible story to tell, like it sounds really bad. But it's the truth, right? I mean, that's just how it happens. So, the Hugh didn't hit me there. So, that, I don't know where Hugh came from, but just. Uh, his last name is a combination of my wife's and mine. So, it's actually Hofflin rather than Hoffman Templin or Templin Hoffman or whatever. So, uh, I'd be willing to change my last name because that's just how it rolls. But Lisa's not. So. So we can't come to the middle. We've got to both make it happen. So we're going to both going to keep our names, but he's going to be Hofflin. So anyway, uh, so in class, uh, Hugh has brought a few things for you. Uh, Hugh, on his on behalf of him being alive and well, would like to give you free quiz points today, so everybody gets five points just for the quiz. Uh, Hugh also thought I was working you too hard, so he dropped the last homework. So we only have six instead of seven now. All right, sound good. So, what's the, so far, so good? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, that's what everybody would like to say, but uh, I, I like to call him Hugh. Lisa loves to call him Baby Huey. She says that she'll call him Huey until he tells her not to, but I think Hugh is just a nice, distinguished, you know, anyway, even when he's like two weeks old. But yeah, um, if I could hack my body to have another child by the end of the semester, uh, <laughs> I can t tell you my wife's not too pleased with that idea. Not that uh, I, I'm not either. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, but we still have, uh, so next week on the first uh, homework four is due. Um, I've heard reports from random people that homework four is not as bad as homework three. Um, it's very much more directed. You like do this, do this, do this. I didn't say why to do all that. That's what this class is about. So we're going to talk about that just a little bit. But homework four is building a scale with confirmatory factor analysis. Also due next week is your project two. Uh, and I'm not looking for a freaking thesis here. I'm not looking for you to, you know, just Tell me again what you're going to do. Give me brief lit review background. I mean, brief, however brief, paragraph would be fine. More than that's fine too, but just, you know. And then lay out the models that you're going to do, or your hypotheses, and then the models you're going to build to test those. And the reason for that is, uh, and if you're sitting there like most people and you're thinking to yourself, self, um, I have hypotheses, I have a hunch, but I have no idea about the models, that's where. I can help. And that's why I want to help you build it. So homework, the project two, you turn something in that has your hypotheses and a stab at the models, and I will help you build the models to test those hypotheses to move forward. Okay? Yes. Bridget. Can you say sampling designs? Mm -hmm. you the yeah. Where you got them from, and if there's any weird consideration about um, I think you have children and families. If you have multiple children from the same family, or do you have children that might show up when they perhaps uh, placed in different families, or things like that, for your data? I think that's what your data is about. Um, but uh, but generally, just um, sometimes you'll have nested data, or you'll have longitudinal data, uh, and I just want to know a little bit more about that. I'm not sure that we can get to all the the, the technical details you'd need to do to do the pinnacle analysis of it, but just helps to understand what we could build in the process. Other uh, other questions? So, so I'm my goal with the project is not, again, not to, I, actually, I teach this class because I want you to learn. I don't want to punish you with the project, but it's more just I want to, we've got so much, there's like 18 different facets of these models, right? There's the technical side, there's this model specification, <laughs> there's Levon, there's R, right? Every one of those is broken at least once or twice for each of us, right? If not more. 
Um, my goal with the project is to kind of give you a chance to kind of do your own directed learning on the details of the class. So um, if what your project is, is related, hopefully it's somewhat related to things you're interested in or maybe analyses you may have to do subsequently, that would be my chance to try to inform you on things. Uh, but I'm also not looking for it to be a, a dissertation or a thesis. This is just a class project. Love it if you could do more with it, but if you can't, that's fine too. It's not a problem. No, no letdown. Just we need to, to get that taken care of. It's to learn more. Okay? All right. It's also hopefully not a, not a hoop to jump through. I hope, I'm hoping if it's the beginning to something rather than like another hoop that you have to jump through. Lord only knows how many of those we have in grad school. Does it feel like that for you? Like you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to do that. You know what they don't tell you is after you get out, they just, the hoops keep continuing. <laughs> they just, you gotta do, at least uh, in my career, in academics, you do this, and you gotta do that, and you gotta do that, and you gotta get tenure, and you gotta do this, and you gotta do that. And it just, it seems like maybe just it's just hoop jumping. Or maybe I'm in the wrong location. No, that's okay. I like this stuff, so. So, uh, other questions or thoughts on class before we really get started? Nothing. Awesome. Do you remember factors? Actually, let me back up. What do you remember about class? <laughs> I'll leave it open-ended. Like, if I were to ask you the top, the first word that comes to mind when I say, what's up with Templin's class? Word one is? Path analysis, yes. The bane of your existence. Path analysis? Anybody else? The bane's laughing. Your hashtag was the first thing that came Hashtag WTF. I love it. <laughs> I hope to, by the way, I feel um, because thankfully everybody's healthy. Lisa and Hugh are healthy and everything's, it's, you know, not easy, but at the same time, it's a whole lot different stress. I feel much happier right now. So, like, hopefully I'm not as tightly wound as before. So WTF template, I, I'm, I think that's good. I like that. So please poke fun at me. It, it will be hopefully even more well received than before. So, I like that. Um, so path analysis, anyone remember R? <laughs> Anybody try to forget R? No. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Do you have like a, is anyone going to get a license plate, the a personalized license plate with an R command on it? Levon one or something like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, no, nah, never mind. I'll tell that story later. So, <laughs> I tried. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, the WTF Templin was uh, started started a little bit after here, uh, but, but while I was here the last time when I moved to Kansas, I wanted the personalized plate. So, oh, why not? Yeah, it would be kind of fun. So I tried to get the plate that was Dude WTF. All right, and it was great because I put that in and. I went to go and, and I went to the, like, I did it at the courthouse downtown. And I remember the, the clerk at the courthouse was like, what does that mean? And I said, well, it's, it's kind of like a, like a kind of a joke. You know, like, like people would, um, like my family, my mom would always, people in a hurry, like, oh, where's the fire? You know, WTF. Trying to come up with something quick. Oh, okay, okay. And then she, oh, no. I think it could mean something else. Yeah, it could, but well, I'll put it in. And sure enough, the state, after a year and a half, said, no, you can't have dude WTF. So it became a hashtag. <laughs> so anyway, my, my plate on the way, by that time, I had already gotten another job, and I was leaving, and so my, new, my plate said UGA dogs. All right, that's good. I'm going to Georgia. That'd be fine. But now I don't, now I'm back. I have a Jayhawk license plate. So I'm, I'm here. I'm vested. I'm not going to get a dude WTF. It'll just be my hashtag. Okay, so getting back into this, I'm trying to keep this light, not too demanding today. Factors. Do you remember factor analysis? We, we had a week on factor analysis where I screwed up and taught every different identification thing. What do you remember about factors? Jen, Jen looks like Jennifer. Really thing to say. Yeah. Okay, what shape does a factor look like in a path diagram? Circle. Circle, there we go. <laughs> There we go. Do factors exist? No. no. Well, that's a good question. What is existence? <laughs> I feel like we're starting to get into the matrix again. Right? There is no spoon, right? <laughs> There's no such thing as a factor. 
Uh, yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, are factors like path analysis? Better yet, how are factors like factor analysis or path analysis? Pretty much the same thing. You've got a bunch of simultaneous equations, mm -hmm. regression equations. It's oh. just the thing that's on the, uh, or the factor shows up in each of those equations. It can go on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Uh, it's just a, a term that we didn't observe. It's a latent variable. And um, well, that's basically it. Is a factor, uh, in a, a, a factor model like this right here, where we're just going to build, we have a set of items and we're going to build one a one factor scale with it. Uh, is that factor an endogenous variable or an exogenous variable? It is exogenous because nothing predicts it, right? The items of this analysis would be the endogenous variables because it's the factor that are predicting those. Now in path analysis, remember endogenous and exogenous help us make counts of things for what's going on in our model. In the factor analysis, while the factor is exogenous, it doesn't count as a variable because it doesn't exist. It's one of those weird things that we have to work with. So, so I like to introduce factor analysis uh, where we do one factor at a time. We build a scale with one factor. Uh, but most of our studies, most of our scales aren't one factor, uh, particularly in personality or in um, Non-cognitive testing, sometimes we call it. Um, so the multiple factor analysis, we're going to talk about methods for that next week. But really, to me, it starts with each one of those factors that you want to measure. You try to isolate and measure, it, measure each one separately to see if a model fits there and then build it. What do you remember about model fit from path analysis? What are, what's uh, some of the model fit indices? Let me ask that. Our initials, it's good. There's the SRMR. SRMR. CFI. TLI. RMSEA. Anybody else? That's good, right? And why was model fit important? Bingo. Because the results will be biased. The, the numbers that you get in the computer for a misfitting model are not likely to be accurate. So whatever you say about your model is not going to be accurate. So. Same thing with factor analysis. Model fit is everything. right? Because the factor doesn't exist, the factor analysis specification represents a hypothesis, just like we'd have in a path analysis. Right? So your hypothesis is that this one factor is being measured by each of the items on a survey or scale that you hand out. And model fit is your way of testing that hypothesis. Right? Each one of those indices or the, the big likelihood ratio test comparing the saturated model, remember the saturated model? Everything estimated versus your model um, would also be a way of it. So what you want to show is that you don't reject your hypothesized one, fact, one factor model, the model fits, before going to use it, before giving people test scores with it or before uh, using it in subsequent analyses, uh, whether that be a multiple factor analysis or whether that's structural equation model or everything that we do. Questions? Is this all coming back? Okay, so all the stuff about assessing model fit is the same from path analysis. All right, we build our model, we estimate it, we check the fit. Um, what differs in factor analysis is a little bit of the interpretation and <laughs> our ability to shape reality to the way we wish it to conform to. Right. So let, that's what this class is about today. We don't have item. We don't have a factor. We have a set of items. What do we do when those items don't fit our factor? Oh my goodness! By the way, that's like what my mother-in-law says all the time when the baby cries. Oh my goodness! I gotta gotta cut that. Cut that from the language. I hear it too much. Okay, moving forward here. So what we're going to talk about today are a little bit of model fit, model modification, scale interpretation, and item information. You've seen model fit before, 
but model, modification is a little bit different in factor analysis. Uh, there are a couple different ways to go. We're going to go with the um, large-scale testing um, company approach, which is if an item, if a model doesn't fit, we look for bad items and we throw the items out, therefore forcing our scale to fit our preconceived notion of the factor itself. That's what to keep in mind here. Every time we throw out an item, we're changing the meaning and the what the of the what the scale app actually represents, what the factor app represents. By the way, I use the word scale and factor interchangeably. Right. As you go forward with this, you may think of a test score and a factor and a scale. All those words are interchangeable. Uh, ultimately, what we're doing here, and the most what I want to impress on you about in factor analysis, or anytime you may use a scale in your survey research is that that scale itself is the result of a bunch of uh, assumptions, and this is a method for testing those assumptions. Right? Okay. So model modification, we're going to talk about interpreting the scale, and we'll talk a little bit about item information. Item information is, um, and I haven't even defined reliability yet, that's going to be in a couple of weeks, but item information is what um, each item contributes to the knowledge of the factor itself. Um, for those of you who've taken item response theory, you've heard of item information before? Anybody heard of that? Yeah. yeah it's the same thing. It's just we don't talk about it in CFA, um, mainly because it's constant. But we'll, I'll show you that in just a bit when we get there. Okay. So, a couple questions. What methods are used to remove misfitting items from a one-factor model? And what is item information? We're using data from the gambling study that I told you about, where I learned to gamble in grad school. We gambled with grant money. Yeah. Try to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Way to go, Larry Jones. <laughs> um, we're going to have uh, all 1,346 people that are somewhere between experienced gamblers or college students from this university. Um, and what we want to do is uh, take the first 24 items of this scale. The scale had 41 items altogether, and uh, they were broken into segments. Like the first 24 were some type of gambling tendencies, the second one was gambling history or something along those lines, but we broke it into two sections. Uh, the first 24 we're going to use, we're going to try to build a one-factor scale from these 24 items uh, that talk about long-term gambling tendencies. So this factor itself is going to be something that talks about your tendency to want to gamble. All right? Anyone been to a casino lately? No. Nobody would admit it, right? Anyway, anyone gone to Vegas lately? <laughs> anyway, never mind. Here, here's the uh, the ten. So the gambling research, just to refresh your memory and to refresh mine too, um, this scale was built off of the DSM um, definition of pathological gambling. There are 10 criteria that represent people with tendency to have uh, pathological gambling activity, uh, probable pathological gamblers. And the definition in the book says a person has to be Di uh, have to meet five of these ten to be diagnosed as a probable pathological log gambler. Now on that side, I don't think anyone ever pays attention to the DSM, or if they do, they think it's garbage. But let's just take this for what it's worth and go with it. Did anyone have that? Those of you who aren't, see I do quant research, but I occasionally get out of the office and talk to people who do not quant. Did any of you work with the DSM? What do you think of the DSM? Don't, don't like it? Is it really just kind of people's thoughts put into a book? They went off the wall with science. Off the wall. Okay. So this, so this is not taking. Well, yeah. So yeah, there, there are there a few things that are okay, but not. This is one of those ones where I'm kind of like, what? Um, the methodology we're going to use today is not actually taking the DSM and trying to break it, although we could build methodology into it. So this isn't trying to say the DS DSM is any good. It's just using that as a guide for it. But that's a good perspective to have. So do you, do you ever use the DSM in any of your, your work? Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's garbage. It's an interesting, it's, a, it's a, such an interesting world we live in. Do you, have, do you feel like you have to use it? Well, we see clients, so we have to diagnose them. Ah, okay, so you have to know the DSM to figure out how to diagnose your clients. You can use ICDM. Oh, okay, is that better than the DSM? Oh, okay, and that's the international? 
Ah, oh, that's good. That's that's good. So this is the perspective. I'm glad that. Thank you for for sharing on that. Yeah, the DSM. Um, this is exactly what I've heard from pretty much everybody who's ever opened the book. So anyway, these are from uh, version four. I don't know if they changed in version five. Okay, so the, if you take a look at the first 24 items of this um, instrument, you'll see that the first, uh, each of the items was written to measure one of these 10 criteria. I didn't actually give you the list of the items this year. I can give them to you if you're interested, but just as a raw count. So you see that we have um, some criteria were measured by four items, three of them, but some criteria are also measured just by one. And so we could think of each of those criteria in the DSM. If we really wanted to, we could try to build a 10-factor model where we try to get a kind of a score or a scale value for each person on each criteria. But because we have such limited items for many of these in this first 24, we're not able to do that. You cannot, I haven't mentioned this yet, but you, or actually I did mention this, to identify a factor, not only do you accept the mean and variance, but you also have to have a minimum number of items. Right? And for one factor all by itself, you need to have at least three items. Four if you want to test it. Three is the minimum. Four is the hypothesis test that it's actually a factor. So here, if we were trying to do a single factor analysis just on the, the criterion four, to build a criterion four factor, if you will, uh, we couldn't do it. We just have one item. So what we're going to do is just say, we're going to pool all these together and come up with one big, happy, gambling factor. Does that make sense? Does he ever put the word happy and gambling together? When the stock market's up, right? <laughs> hmm? Maybe with your, uh, your bracket, right? Maybe when, yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I actually do think some of my happiest photos of me is with me in, <gasps> in Vegas in front of certain slot machines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Except for the one with me holding my son for the first time. That's not. <laughs> anyway, gambling and winning, you know. Um, so that's it. We're going to build one factor of these 24, and, and we're going to start with all 24 items. So, um, well, that's what we just mentioned right here. Uh, the key to all of this, we're going to create this gambling ten tendencies factor. And we're going to, uh, the, the first step is to, to put all this into Levon and to see if our one-factor model fits the data. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Now on Levon, let's see here, oh, there's the code, cool. I have it there, I'll talk about the syntax in just a bit. But um, the problem is, um, we have 24 items. And these items are all measured as six-point Likert scales, right? So we're going to pretend that these items are continuous. We're going to treat them as the 24 of those is following this multivariate normal distribution. So how many parameters would we have in our saturated model? If we look at the number of means, the number of variances, and the number of covariances that we have. Well, 24 items. How many means do we have? 24 means. And how many uh, variances do we have? 24 variances. Now the covariances are a little bit harder. That's the number of items times the number of items minus 1 over 2. All right, so that would be 12 times 23. What's this? 276. 276. 276 covariances. All right, so doing the math here, we, that means we have a total of 300 and uh, 300 parameters from the variances and covariances, and 24 from the mean altogether. All right. That is a lot of parameters. All right? It's a tremendous, tremendous amount. So, how many? If we if we say each each item measures uh, this one factor, right? So each item has one factor loading. Uh, do you remember the model for, actually, let me back up. Do you remember the model parameters of the factor analysis model itself? Right. We take an item, call it Y uh, for a given person, and an item, 
the model gives each item its own intercept, which we call it, which we use a mu to usually denote. And gives each for each factor measured by the item gives each item uh, a factor loading. This is the factor loading I for factor F. The factor is a person thing. And then we have this error term for the person and item. And the error term follows a normal distribution with an estimated unique variance for the item. All right, so for each item, we have up to three parameters. Now, so if we were to calculate this for our number of parameters in our model with one factor, we would see that we had 24 means estimated, right, so 24 of these, 24 factor loadings, potentially. I'll say potentially there because it depends on how we go and identify the factor variance, right? Remember the factor variance, we can either estimate it by setting one of these equal to one, or we can uh, set it equal to one and estimate everything. So I'll just put a star here. 24, or actually 24 or 23, right? Depending on whether, how we do it. And then for each unique variance, we get an estimate of all 24 of those. So adding this up, actually, one step further, the factor itself for a given person, we say it follows a normal distribution. And that's where we have to make our assumptions, right? We have to set its mean. We have to somehow set its variance. We're going to use the marker item approach, right? So we're going to say that there are 23 factor loadings. The very first factor loading, so the factor loading for item one, we're going to set equal to one, just arbitrarily. So that means we're going to be able to estimate the variance of the factor. And for the mean of the factor, we're just going to set that equal to zero. We don't need to estimate. So adding up the number of parameters we have, we have 24 item intercepts, 24 unique variances, that's 48, 23 factor loadings, that makes 71, and one factor variance. So that's 72, I hope. That's 72? Yeah, 24, 24, okay. The hour units, I think, day long hour, yeah, something like that. Factors 24. How are we doing, right? This is, do you remember all this? Okay, so setting the first item's factor loading to one is a little weird, but it's just because we don't, we don't know what the factor variance happens to be. Uh, and it will estimate it when we go through this. And from, from pretty much all of the analyses that we do in this class from now on, we're going to use that. So we just focus on that and not worry about the other ways that we could do this for right now. Okay? Questions? All right. So what we're trying to do with these 24 items, so our model had 24 intercepts, and then we had um, 23, 24, 48, 48 loadings plus unique vari variances, U, V. Right. And I'm separating that because the intercepts map on to the mean vector in the saturated model. And the loadings and unique variances map onto the variance and covariance matrix of the saturated model. And I'm trying to make this point that if we were go to do this, what we're trying to say is that our 48, sorry, our 24 mean vector intercepts, 24 intercepts, we have one intercept for every mean vector. So we would expect the mean vector that we estimate based on our intercepts to be roughly the same as the saturated model, we essentially saturated it. It's the variance and covariance matrix where we might see a big difference in fit. There are 300 parameters overall in the variance covariance matrix, saturated model. And our model is presupposing there are only 48 needed. Okay. That's a huge difference in the number of parameters. All of these 48 parameters have to do the job that 300 do later on. Megan's eyebrows say it all. Sorry to pick on you, Megan. 
What is those? I what does that say? It's a lot. What WTF? Right, that is a lot. All right, but that is what our hypothesis say. We're saying that if these twenty-four items fit a one-factor model, that we should see that we only need forty-eight parameters to do the work of three hundred. If they don't fit the one-factor model, we should say that forty-eight does not fit better. We have to reject that, or it does not fit as well. This remember this saturated model fits the best always. Nothing fits better than it in this class of models. Thoughts, questions. In the surveys you work with, how many items are you used to having? Do you have surveys? <laughs> <laughs> no. Used to? Used to. Used to. What did you used to have? Uh, Is that honey on your desk? Yes. That's awesome. I had honey before I got here. Hmm. Way to go. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, what was the question again? How, what, how many items were you used to having uh, in your surveys from before? So you're into this situation. Did they measure one thing, one factor? The eight item ones, yes. The longer ones, kind of sort of. Kind of sort of. Okay. How many about how many of you took the GRE? <sighs> Stupid question, right? <laughs> how many items did you have to take on the GRE? Five hours worth of items? I lost count after yeah. like 10 minutes. Huh? So how many, uh, so but you got three scores or two scores, right? Verbal and uh, verbal and math? And writing. And writing. You had, write, you had to write for the, the, uh, the you wrote for the, uh, right, right? So let's just do the, the verbal and math are easier to talk about. So all of those, I'm, what I'm trying to build here for you is all of those items of the GRE, let's take all the math, this was the situation, right? You had, did you have at least 24 items in math? Yeah? And it was measuring one math factor. So the GRE was supposing something like this right here, too. I say something like because whenever we, we look at items in the GRE, they're treated as, as um, not continuous. So the model fits a little iffy. But anyway, you can see this being an enormous task. To get model fit, to get 48 things to do the job of 300, that takes a lot, right? I feel like I'm, uh, keep saying the 300, isn't that, a, isn't that the movie? I've been this is Sparta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You got, I mean, just like the Spartans, how many, how many people were they fighting in this movie? Let's see if I can do this. Don't make me pull up the, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Oh, the internet meme, this is Sparta. It was also, I mean, it was a movie before it was a meme. No, yeah, it was, it was, it was the, uh, all right, now I got to do that. Keep the ink. Let's go here. Why did I pull up Internet Explorer? Is anyone using it? But speaking of, hey, the next version of Internet Explorer is dead. The new Microsoft browser is Project Spartan, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, all right? So, hey, it's all coming full circle. Okay, Google. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about here? This is Sparta. Uh, <laughs> sorry. There we go, this one. <laughs> anyway, um, if you remember this movie, um, now we'll do this. This is Sparta plot. It's not, not just a movie. It actually, it actually is like a historical thing. They were fighting a number. Oh, there we go. An invading army of 300,000 soldiers. And uh, this guy, Gerard Butler, had 300 Spartans. <laughs> so Gerard Butler versus Xerxes, right? That's, anyway, you know, in, ter in terms of like history or mythology or whatever, that's kind of what we're doing right here. I'm trying to draw the reference. 
We've got 300 parameters. That's the invading Persians. Xerxes, I'm trying to think here, yeah? And so, and, and we've got 48 Spartans of loadings and, and unique variants and whatnot. How did that 300 thing work out? They didn't do too well, right? That's because they got sold out. They got sold out, whatever. They didn't do too well. So you're saying one of our factors... What I'm saying is it's really tough to get a one-factor model to fit as it is, right? This is Sparta, right? So anyway, any of you going to watch this movie now after we're out? Anyway, no. Um, so the point in all this is to get you thinking about how difficult it is to get one, one, fact, one factor to fit. And the key is... You have to balance. You have to have model fit before you use the results of later on because anything you do later on may be not right. right. So how do you balance model fit with the actual preservation of this thing that you want to measure, this construct? right? In theory, gambling should take into consideration all 10 of these criteria. Can we hold all 10 together and, and build a, a scale? I don't know the answer. We're going to find out. So that's kind of what we're after here. Okay. Questions? So this kind of implies you want fewer items. Uh, fewer items makes model fit better, but it makes model... That's it. That's it. Your reliability sinks. But here, here's the funny thing about reliability. Any, you can always calculate a reliability coefficient. I know we've talked about this. But we, you can always calculate your Spearman... Spearman? I always call it gut... And, or your... Sorry, your Kronbach's alpha... <laughs> Gutman came up with it first, but your Kronbach alpha, sometimes called the Gutman Kronbach alpha, uh, you can always calculate it. But if your model doesn't fit, your alpha is way too high. How high? You don't know how high. All right? Doesn't that sound like another movie? It was a movie yeah, I was gonna. Say. So, um, so um, yeah, that's it. The fewer items you have, the closer you get to model fit. The next question is how much reliability is what you need to do what you want to do at the scale. So it's a tough trade-off to make. Questions? Am I wasting your time with the movie references? This is better than matrices? All right. See, it's a kinder and kinder, kinder, kinder and gentler Templin now. You know, I've got, got a baby at home. You know. So having a baby makes you more like the Nozo. Gotcha. Didn't, who? Sorry, no, I don't. Yeah, I don't watch TV unless there's sports on it, usually. Or, yeah, I don't really, I, and that's the thing, I only watch the internet meme of the movie. <laughs> I haven't actually moved. No, I knew the history behind it, but I didn't know the meme itself. Okay, so here, first step, we need to go and estimate this one factor model, and here is Levon's syntax for it. Let me zoom in. The key in this syntax is, I don't know if you can see my hand, on, or this little hand on the screen. Do you see this? Whoa, floating hand up here. It is this equal tilde. Equal tilde is what Levon interprets as saying anything, the thing on the left-hand side is a factor, and the thing on the right-hand side are what are the items or, or things that are measuring it. Now you'll note that is very different from path analysis. Because in path analysis, we just had a single tilde here. And the thing on the left-hand side was a dependent variable. And the thing on the right-hand side was the thing that was predicting. If we were to take that literal dependent variable thing predicting it, we would flip these for factor analysis. Right? Each of these items is the dependent variable in a factor analysis. The factor is the thing that's predicting it. Right? Here's the equation right here. Y is the item. F is the factor. So this syntax is a little whack like that. Right? It's just built to be somewhat simple, but it flips the whole meaning of it. So just a note on that. Gambling is not our dependent variable here. Gambling is the thing that's going to predict all these items. Questions? OK. So we put all 24 items after the equal tilde, and we separate them by the plus sign. That just They're not added together. That just means we've got more items. And then uh, we take this model syntax and plug it into the SEM function as we have used with path analysis. 
so in theory, what this syntax that you see up here, this brief snippet of syntax, does everything you need it to do for this factor analysis. Um, and then we check the model fit. Questions on syntax and code? Yeah, Jennifer. So what earlier I wrote down, we talked yep. about that single program is predicted by. Yep. What is, how can you say the word for equal program? Uh, is measured by. The factor doesn't exist, okay. and so what that means is that, That's it. yeah, okay. yeah, this this factor is being measured by these items. Okay. Yep. It's it we we can't really use the word is predicted by because the factor is not being predicted here. The factor is the thing doing the prediction, but because it doesn't exist, what we're saying is that these items are the entities that we're going to draw the factor from, right? And if the factor fits the model, it's the it comes from the, the relationships between the items that gives us the factor itself. So it's basically the same thing, just with a latent No, <laughs> it's not. Because if this were, here's your equation for what this model is implying. We'd have 24 equations for it. The, the actual path model syntax would have each one of these GRI items on the left-hand side of the tilde with gambling on the right hand side. That would be a lot more code to write, and I think that's why they shorten it to make it look this way. But but conceptually, that's what's happening. Does that help? Yeah. I lose anybody there. It's a flip, right? This is our model, our factor model. Here's the factor right here. Right? If we had observed the factor, the syntax would look like this. Y single tilde F, right? And because we have 24 of them, there'd be Y2 all the way down to the last 24. That's if we had observed it. That's the path analysis version. But we didn't observe it, so that's where tilde equals is in there. I, I, uh, I keep talking about this, but I never ever finish it. I'm writing a little software myself that does a lot of this stuff. And in my syntax, it tries to shorten this, but keep it in the right direction. Because it just irks me. Right? If you use M+, plus, the single tilde is called on. You put on instead of single to the word on. If you, in the, and the tilde, or equal tilde, is the word by. The double tilde is the word with. <laughs> it's all a preposition of some sort. I'm waiting for something above. <laughs> they had their chance with multi-level, but they ended up splitting that would be between and within, uh, which are also prepositions, I believe. Right? Help me out here, somebody. Preposition. Thank you. <laughs> Above and below. Other thoughts, questions? Do you, do you follow me now? Right. The syntax is not what you'd think about from a path analysis if we were observed F. That would be 24 lines of code having observed F. Observed F. But because we haven't observed F, we have to use this clunk up here to make it work. Clunk, can I make clunk a noun? Clunky, that's clunk, right? No? I keep looking at Jennifer. I hear you have a degree in English. I'm not going to endorse these nonifications. Nonifications? I've always thought a pronounceable non-word is actually a word. It's just a word that has yet been used or defined. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, we're up against a break. Can we take 10 minutes? All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>